Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to Crisis of Crime. My name is Rachel Means and I'm a criminologist. Thank you so much for joining me today for my weekly podcast where we talk about criminological theory and criminal justice reform. I know that I was off last week. I had some personal stuff come up that I had to take care of, but I am back this week and ready to rumble. Today, I want to talk about a type of crime that I don't think that we talk about enough on here, and that is white collar crime. Now, when you hear the word white collar crime, it's very likely that you think of Wall Street or movies like The Wolf of Wall Street or Wall Street or Gordon Gecko or something like that. And you're not wrong, but there's a lot more to these crimes than just what you see on TVs and movies. For almost all my examples today, I'm going to be talking about individuals who are involved with the Enron scandal. So I'm not going to be going through what actually happened during the Enron scandal, but rather I'm going to be talking about the theories that these individuals fall into under white collar crime. If you do want to watch a really great documentary about the Enron scandal, there is one. It is called Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room, and it's a fantastic overview of what exactly happened during the whole scandal. So if you want to watch that and come back and listen to this, it might make a little bit more sense. Or if you have a pretty good grasp on what happened during the scandal, then you should have no problem following along. But for those of you who are not familiar with the Enron scandal, Enron was a company who dealt in energy, mainly electricity, natural gas, and also communications. And it was founded in 1985 by a man named Kenneth Lay, and it was a merger of two different smaller companies, and they became this mega corporation. Enron was a publicly traded company, so there were stocks and shareholders, and based on the numbers that Enron had released that showed that they were having growth in pretty much every single quarter and that they were making their shareholders a ton of money. But what people didn't know behind the scenes was that they were faking all of the numbers and that they were actually losing money at a crazy high rate. So in 2001, it all came to light, and now it's one of the biggest examples of willful corporate fraud and corruption in American history. They ended up having to file for bankruptcy, and they lost their shareholders about $74 billion, billion with a B. That is a lot of money. So today we are going to be talking about the men involved with the Enron scandal, four men in particular, which I will get to in just a moment. But first, I kind of want to just give a brief overview of these white collar crimes because they're different than other crimes. Generally, when you hear the word crime, you think about a street level crime, something like somebody getting assaulted or murdered. And these are what are known as hot crimes because they elicit a lot of emotion and like a physiological response in us. We get angry, we get heated, we demand justice for these types of crimes. White collar crimes, on the other hand, are generally defined as nonviolent and financially motivated. And the offenders of these white collar crimes generally fit a pretty specific stereotype. They're generally people who are in positions of power, they are well respected and trusted, and they tend to be of a high social status. On top of that, there are certain occupations that make people more vulnerable or susceptible to white collar crimes. And you probably guessed working in the stock market or on Wall Street is definitely one of those jobs where it becomes more of a susceptibility. Another big difference between these hot crimes and white collar crimes is defining who the victim is. If it's a hot crime, say somebody gets murdered, it's very easy to see who the victim was in that situation. The person who got murdered is the victim. We can demand justice for that victim. But when it comes to white collar crimes, it's a lot more gray. For example, during the Enron scandal, Enron dealt with electricity and they acquired a company, it was Portland Gas and Electric, and they controlled a lot of the electricity in California. And so what Enron did was they took the electricity for California and they decided to create rolling blackouts because they wanted to use that opportunity of rolling blackouts to jack up the prices of electricity and force people to pay a higher bill. There was no specific reason why they did this. They just wanted to make more money and they were greedy, hence the corporate fraud and corruption. But in that case, when it's affecting a huge amount of the state of California, it's hard to pinpoint exactly who the victim was because there were millions of people impacted. So yes, a ton of people were affected by this heinous crime of having rolling blackouts and then jacking up the prices of electricity. But 
it's not going to elicit the same emotional response compared to if a kid is murdered in your town. Sometimes it's hard for people to wrap their heads around when there's so many people being affected by something. It's hard for us to want to demand justice or to even think that we can do anything about it. When it's one kid that's been murdered, we can say, okay, we need to find that murderer, that person. We put them in jail. Okay, justice has been served. When it's white collar crimes like this and millions of people have been impacted and it's from a corporation not like a single person, it's a lot harder to point fingers to say exactly who's responsible and exactly who's the victim. And so a lot of times people will just say, okay, well, there's nothing that we can do about it and nothing gets done. So kind of back to the four main guys that I want to talk about from Enron. Their names are Kenneth Lay, Jeffrey Skilling, Lou Pai, and Annie Fastow. So each one of these guys had their own motivations for why they committed the white collar crimes that they did. So I want to talk about the theories that go along with what motivated each one of these men. And these theories fall under the white collar crime umbrella. So for all four of these guys involved in the Enron scandal, there are two overlaying theories that fit all four of them. And those are the organizational theory and the opportunity theory. The organizational theory is interesting because you cannot apply it to just one single person. It has to be a group of people. And this theory states that if an organization has the proper checks and balances in order, like having an external review board or some sort of process to make sure that fraud and corruption are not happening, then it's much less likely that employees there are going to be engaging in criminal activity. For the case of Enron, They did technically have an external review board, but these review boards were getting paid around $1 million a week to turn a blind eye. And yes, I said $1 million a week. So since all four of these men knew that there wasn't going to be a review board having any oversight over them, they knew that they didn't have to worry about getting caught performing any kind of illegal activity. The opportunity theory, on the other hand, essentially says that there are certain cultural configurations and social structures that essentially promote this desire for the American dream. And for people who are very motivated to meet their goals and have this American dream, that they are more likely to be involved in criminal activity if the opportunity presents itself. I want to pause here really quick because I've talked about the American dream with another criminological theory, and that was the anime theory. And I want to quickly distinguish the difference between the anime theory and the theory of white collar crime when it comes to the American dream. So for anime, if somebody is trying to achieve the American dream, the place that they are going to be committing crimes is before they reach the American dream. They're going to be committing crimes in order to get to that place of status. So for example, with the anime theory, say somebody forged their transcripts so that they could get a really good job of a high status, it was high paying, but they committed a crime to get there. They forged their transcripts, that's a crime. For white collar crime, on the other hand, they're gonna be committing crimes once they're in that social status. So everything's gonna be legitimate up into getting to that point, but once they're there, then they are going to take that opportunity that they have with being in that high social status and that respected position and use that to commit crimes. So the enemy theory is committing crimes to get to the social status. The white collar crime is committing crimes once you're in that social status. So that's kind of the best way I can describe the difference between those two in regards to the American dream. So Kenneth Lay was the first CEO of Enron in 1985. He grew up in a pretty small town. He was the son of a Baptist preacher, and he was raised in a relatively low-income family. But Kenneth Lay's biggest dream growing up was to be wealthy and successful. Now, you've likely heard me talk about the biosocial theory of crime on this podcast before. So there's another theory. It's called the social psychological theory, and that's really that social side of the biosocial. So this theory essentially states that an individual's history and biographies along with early family environments, their peer relationships, and any significant others can influence their activity as they develop. And this theory has a lot to do with bonding and how people form relationships. So the greater someone bonds with positive structures such as religion or their family or their community, the less likely they are to engage in criminal activity. But since Kenneth Lay was focusing on really just 
being successful and wealthy from a very young age, he put money and material things ahead of everything else. When he started Enron, his number one goal was to deregulate the energy sector and use that deregulation legislation to his advantage. And coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, Kenneth Lay actually became really good friends with the Bush family. And so it's not surprising that Enron was the single largest contributor to a presidential campaign for both George Bush Sr. and George W. Bush when they both ran for president. I'll let you put two and two together about how and why the deregulation happened and how corporations and politicians usually work together for that kind of stuff, but that is not what this episode is about. So Kenneth Lay has always had pretty questionable motives. So Enron starts in 1985, and in 1987, something called the Valhalla scandal happened. And essentially what happened was two Enron traders, not like traders against the company, but like they traded stocks and bonds and stuff. So two Enron traders, They were essentially found to be gambling with Enron money, but when Lay looked into it, they were winning every single time they took that gamble. So instead of firing these two men for stealing money and gambling with it from the company, instead he said, keep doing that and keep making us more money. And just to be clear, Kenneth Lay knew that this was illegal and he still encouraged it. This is where we can talk about another theory of criminology, and that is differential association. You've probably heard this one. It's pretty popular, and it's essentially that people learn criminal activity from one another. But more specifically, it's that the behavior, that criminal behavior, is accepted as normal in that social setting. So that's why in Enron, it became normal in the social setting for people to engage in criminal activity. So I want to bring up Wheeler's microeconomic variables and something called the fear of falling, which essentially means that people are more afraid of losing something that they own or have compared to the pleasure that they feel by getting something new. So Kenneth Lay would rather promote criminal activity within Enron to keep the success going that he has in the company rather than understanding that maybe it's not doing as well as it should and moving on to a new venture. Next up on our list is Jeffrey Skilling. He was also a CEO at Enron, but just after Kenneth Lay. So Jeffrey Skilling showed a lot of those characteristics that go along with antisocial personality disorder, also more commonly known as psychopathic behaviors. One of the biggest ones that Skilling had was that he was an avid risk seeker. So if you listened to my last episode, you heard me talk all about antisocial personality disorder and how it affects the brain and how it can create these certain behaviors. And one of those is the feeling that you need to take risks to be able to feel excitement because you have low arousal. And so Jeffrey Skilling was one of these people and he loved taking risk, not just at Enron with stocks, but physically in real life. He would often take Enron executives on these trips where the activities that they were engaging in were extremely dangerous and even had the possibility of dying during them. For example, on these trips, one guy once broke his arm, one guy busted his lip, and another guy flipped a Jeep and literally almost died. But because Skilling encouraged this risk-seeking behavior, it created this environment of needing to be macho at Enron. And on top of that, it made the employees extremely competitive with each other. A theory that Skillings falls into is the sociological theory. And this theory states that cultural traits such as competitiveness, economic self-interest, materialism, and hedonism help explain why some individuals commit white collar crimes. And Skillings was very competitive and abundantly self-interested. So much so that he created a new way of accounting. It was called mark-to-market accounting. Mark-to-market accounting was also known as hypothetical future value accounting. And if that doesn't sound shady, I don't know what does. So this way of accounting let Enron predict the value a certain deal could make in the future, say over the next 10 years maybe. And those numbers, those numbers that it could make, were taken as the actual numbers on the exact same day that the deal was made. So the day that the deal was made, they had the numbers for the next 10 years as if those were the actual numbers of what that deal was going to make. So you can see the problem here that they're recording these numbers, these hypothetical numbers, when a deal might not even make a penny. It might completely flop, they might lose money on it, 
but they're still going to use those hypothetical numbers to show that it was a successful deal to their shareholders. And this actually happened. Enron made a deal with Blockbuster. We all remember how that ended, right? They were making a deal with them for a way to have broadband on-demand movies. And it flopped. It didn't make any money at all, but it showed that it was very successful on their books. Now you might be asking yourself, why would Jeffrey Skilling do that? Well, to him, he figured if he was putting in all the work right now to make this deal, then he should reap the benefits. So if he makes it look like it's making money over the next 10 years, then he's making more money. So he just felt like he was getting paid what he was owed for making these deals. He didn't think that it was right for him to put in all this work now and then for somebody 10 years later on down the line working at Enron to be paid for the deals that he made. Now that social psychological theory that I talked about with Kenneth Lay is also applicable for Jeffrey Skillings. With people who exhibit antisocial personality disorder, something that they generally have in common is that they struggle with showing empathy. And that certainly was the case for Jeffrey Skilling as well. He did not have very strong social bonds with anything, his community, his family, his religion, nothing like that. And so he was not very empathetic towards other people. Two other theories that fit Jeffrey Skilling that also have to do with economics are the risk analysis theory and the risk management theory. The risk analysis theory is also known as the law of diminishing returns, which says that any unit of consumption, whether it's happiness or pleasure or whatever, that it increases with each additional consumption but at a diminishing rate. So a good way to visualize the law of diminishing returns is if you have two children. Imagine that one child only has a single toy and the other child has a hundred toys. And you give each one of these children a new toy. The one who's getting a second toy is probably gonna be a lot more excited about getting that new toy than the one who has 100. So even though the kid that has a hundred toys has more toys, he's not gonna feel as much happiness or pleasure from getting that toy as the one who's just getting a second one. And this ties into white collar crime because as people become more successful and get more money, it's essentially not as exciting or as rewarding or as pleasurable to receive that new money. And so in the cases of people who are committing white collar crimes that fit into that risk analysis theory, they're doing it because the money that they're getting doesn't feel like enough now that they've been getting it for so long. They want more or they want more power. They wanna feel like they're more in control. And so they end up stepping out of what's normal and committing a criminal act to be able to, whether it's embezzling to get more money or engaging in insider trading so they're guaranteed to win in the stock market. Now the risk management theory fits in with the law of diminishing returns. It says that people who are risk seekers are going to continue taking those risks even though they know that they're diminishing. So even though they know that they're not gonna be as happy or get as much money, they're still gonna continue to do that. It's kind of almost like an addiction at that point. Like they have to continue taking those risks. And those risks become even more exciting to them when they're illegal risks because there's so much more weight that goes along with it. There's more danger, more excitement, and then more pleasure for getting away with it. But Jeffrey Skilling loved having a competitive environment. He created something called the rank and yank, which essentially was a process to rate the employees. And they would rate the employees one to five, five being the worst. And no matter how people were performing in the company, 10% of their workforce had to be put as a five. And that 10% every year would be let go. So this encouraged the employees, specifically those who were involved in trading, to be extremely competitive and step on each other's necks to try to beat each other out because they didn't want to end up in that bottom 10% that was getting a five. Next up on our list is Lupai, and he is probably the most interesting and elusive character here. He was the CEO of Enron Energy Services, which was an offshoot of Enron. And he was pretty unconventional. His favorite things in the world were money and strippers. Do you remember in The Wolf of Wall Street where Jordan Belfort is having a literal party with his employees and strippers come to the floor of Stratton Oakmont where they're usually doing the trading, but now they're doing drugs and having sex everywhere? Well, that was Lou Pai. He would go to the strip club almost every single night and he would end up bringing strippers back to Enron with other employees where they would just party. And Lupai actually left Enron before they filed for bankruptcy. 
and he was the person who got away with the most money out of anyone else. He walked away from Enron with $250 million. Lupai was also responsible for dispatching Enron's enemies. I don't exactly know what that means, but it sounds pretty ominous. But his job essentially was to make sure that nobody got too close to see all the fraud and corruption that was going on. So for Lupai, the sociological theory definitely stands here. He was extremely self-interested, he was hedonistic, and he was materialistic, and that led to him engaging in criminal activity. Last up on our list today is Andy Fastow, and he was the chief financial officer at Enron. He came onto Enron pretty late and he operated under Jeffrey Skilling. Now he idolized Skilling so much. He looked up to him, he wanted to be him. And he was terrified of letting Skilling down or having Enron fail. So he would do anything for Skilling. Andy Fastow was responsible for creating multiple shell companies to hide Enron's debt in. He understood that this was illegal and he knew that he was taking a great risk doing that. So even though he had all this admiration for Skilling and didn't wanna let him down, he still felt like he was taking a really big risk and that he should be compensated for it. So what did Andy Fassow do? He starts embezzling money from Enron. He embezzled around $45 million over his time with Enron. And the funniest part is that Skilling knew that he was doing it and he was just okay with it. Now it didn't turn out super great for Andy Fassow at the end because all the other guys pretty much set him up to be the fall guy when they went to court for it. I mean, a lot of people went to jail for the Enron scandal, but Andy Fassow was definitely the one that they were all pointing their fingers at. So for Andy Fassow, differential association is definitely at play here. He was not only learning how to commit the criminal behavior based on the people that were around him, but it was also seen as normal behavior. Another theory that fits Andy Fassow is the rationalization theory. And this mainly comes to when he was embezzling that $45 million because he was rationalizing, if I'm taking the risk, then I should be the one getting paid for it. So in his mind, he was really doing the right thing. He had rationalized that he was doing the right thing in his head by embezzling that money. He also rationalized that it was necessary that he would hide Enron's debt and these shell companies because he felt like it was the right thing to do, especially looking up to skilling so much and wanting to make sure that he and Enron didn't fail. The last one I'll talk about for Andy Fastow is the risk analysis theory. It's that law of diminishing returns. And for this, I'm talking about the embezzlement again. He was paid very generously as the CFO at Enron, not only because he was CFO, but also because he was doing all this other illegal activity for them. But even though he was paid a ton of money because of that law of diminishing returns, the more and more he made, it wasn't as pleasurable or exciting. And so he felt that he needed to embezzle to make even more to make it worth it. Now, of course, with Enron, everything crumbled to the ground in the end. They ended up filing for bankruptcy. Multiple people went to jail. So I really think you should check out the film Enron, the smartest guy in the room, if you want to get a full detailed picture of exactly what happens and what happened afterwards, because it is really one of the biggest examples of corporate fraud and corruption that we have in American history. That is all I have for you guys today, though. I hope that you found this content interesting. I know that I wasn't talking about the Enron scandal. I was kind of talking around it and just talking about the theory mainly, but I do hope that you go and watch that documentary because it's super interesting. But thank you guys so much again for tuning in today. If you want to learn more about me and what I do, please visit my website. It is at www.crisisofcrime.com. There you will find all of my podcasts, YouTube videos, and my links to social media. If you are interested in supporting this podcast and channel, there is a support tab where you can sign up to become a patron. And as always, a great way to support me is just to like and share this content. So thanks again for listening, and I will see you guys next time.